boom, and we are back continuing the Alexandria section of Assassin's Creed Origins. Um, Discovery Tour is the DLC, not the actual game. Not even DLC, actually. It's like bonus content. Um, not the actual game itself. I didn't actually really like the, the game, so we passed over that. But I found this really exciting and fascinating, so uh, we're doing that right now. Jump back in, Alexandria. Here we go. So I've seen like a lot of uh, videos online talking about how this is uh, the like a revamp of uh, Assassin's Creed. It's probably why I didn't like it, but they said they liked it. So to each their own. City of celebration. Welcome to. Alexandria. Like most Greek cities, Alexandria offered multiple forms of entertainment. Most were related to cults, religious practices, and the festivities surrounding those practices. Hmm. Among those festivities, the most important ones were the dynastic celebrations, instituted in honor of the deified Ptolemaic kings and queens. These celebrations could go on for many days and included sacrifices, offerings, processions, and public banquets. Interesting. I, uh, she said cults there. I just got finished uh, watching Wild Wild Country. If you haven't seen it on Netflix, definitely go check it out. Um, basically, it's like a Osho. I've read a bunch of his books, which is kind of sad, because now I'm like, oh man, I, I didn't know it was like cult books. But he has like a lot of good lessons in there. So it makes you wonder, like, throughout history, how many of, uh, how many of these things were just like fake religious leaders trying to control people i.e. now we are here today with their own modern religions games and competitions were organized whenever possible in locations such as the stadium the hippodrome and the gymnasium the residents of alexandria favored such events where athletes poets and musicians from egypt and other cities of the greek world competed that's kind of cool warrior poet like all good Greek cities, Alexandria had a theater. The architecture of this structure is Roman in style. This is because the team duplicated a theater from Cyrene. Roman theaters were usually semicircular and built from scratch on a flat area with structures designed to enhance oration. Hmm. Greek theaters were more oblong in shape, similar to a horseshoe and favored the slopes of natural hills to support their acoustics. Oh cool, so same same but different. That's kind of cool. At the theater, one could witness the plays of contemporary comic and tragic authors. The play you are witnessing below is Menander's Discolos, more commonly known as the Grouch, a late and popular entry in the Greek comedies. Hmm. We actually played the game. That'd be kind of cool. That's fascinating. All right, let's move on. Well, we only got a few. Maybe we'll try and finish these off, and then we'll end it there. Uh, depending on how time goes. Shave their whole bodies here of lice and other impure things. Interesting. Egyptian priests shave their whole bodies. Okay. Oh, don't knock me over, sir. Welcome to the Moseon of Alexandria. Hmm. Okay. The Moseon for the museum. The Moseon was a sector of the city commissioned by Ptolemy I to rival Athens Academy as an institute of intellectual pursuit. Oh, university. Dedicated to the nine inspiring muses, the Moseon became a great center for philosophical and scientific enlightenment. Hmm, cool. It welcomed scholars from many kingdoms, inviting them to share knowledge in literature, science, and geography. Fascinating. 
The Moseon was designed so that its buildings and grounds would accommodate free thinking, debate, and presentation. Oh, that's sick. Meeting spaces and theaters surrounded a main courtyard. Expansive gardens were filled with exotic plants that aided in the study and supply of herbs and medicines. A zoo offered the study of animal behavior and physiology. Also among the Moseon's many star attractions was its astronomical observatory. Hmm. Seems like old civilization is really fascinated by all this. Uh, it's not, it's not Herophilus was a physician who too. lived most of his life in Alexandria. He was able to perform the dissection of human cadavers on a large scale due to the permissiveness of the city in such matters. Wow. Among many other discoveries, he learned that the brain was central to the human nervous system. How do you figure that out? He also extensively mapped the blood system and measured the pulse with the aid of a water clock. It is reported that in his thirst to understand human anatomy, he performed 600 vivisections on live prisoners. Okay, that's just cruel. What people do. In order to be free to pursue their research, scholars were fed and housed at the Moseon at the government's expense. This freedom provided Alexandria scholars a meeting space for intellectual pursuits and a haven for spiritual peace. Oh, that's sick. Though nothing remains of the original Moseon, it lives on as the legacy of our modern museums. It's like sponsorship. I like it. They get sponsored to study. Or free tuition. Oh, that's interesting. So, right there it says uh, in Egypt, uh, men stayed home and women ran the markets. Totally different. Take your time. I'll wait. It's not like ancient Egypt is going anywhere. Cool, that's cool. Welcome to the Serapion of Alexandria. In a city of numerous magnificent attractions, the Serapion was considered to be the most beautiful temple of Alexandria. Located southwest of the city on a small hill known as the Acropolis, the sanctuary was constructed during the reign of Ptolemy III upon foundations which had existed since the reign of Ptolemy I Soter. Hmm. Okay. There's a lot of Acropolises, or in, uh, maybe it's just a common term. Still haven't looked that up. I'm assuming it's like a main space kind of thing, like a fortress. Visitors of the Serapion climbed a hundred steps to reach the courtyard. Oh, dedication. Libraries were installed in the porticos surrounding the square building, with its roof and columns adorned with gold and gilded bronze. Pharaohs were generous to the temple, as were several Roman emperors after Egypt's conquest. An inner temple housed the statue of Serapis, dedicated to healing the sick. Cool. Spent a lot of cash money on this. Since the 26th dynasty, Greeks in Egypt had gradually integrated the Egyptian cult of the Apis bull to their own rituals. With the establishment of the Ptolemaic dynasty, the cult of Apis was further integrated into Greek religion. During his rule, Ptolemy I chose to merge Egyptian and Hellenic gods into a syncretic divinity named Serapis. This name was the result of the amalgamation of Osiris and Apis. Oh, okay. With this new That's deity, cool. the Ptolemaic dynasty managed to accommodate similar belief sets for two different cultures, bringing about a new dynastic cult. Hmm. Uh, amalgamation, just like other words such as guesstimate. Guess and estimate. That's funny. Serapis <laughs> was also associated to other deities, including Asclepius, a Greek god of healing. It is possible that as with the Serapis Temple of Canopus, the sick would visit this sanctuary, sleeping there overnight in the hopes of being healed within its hallowed halls. Dang, okay. Prayers. 
don't want to do anything, just going to sleep there and hopefully heal up. Oh wow, until 2002, the Greeks were still using their original coin from way back when. Welcome to the Islands of Ferris. Cool. The Heptastadion was a bridge-like causeway connecting the island of Ferris to mainland Alexandria. Its name is based on the Greek terms of measurement, hepta, meaning seven, and stadion, which is a measure of length of roughly 180 meters. So it's seven times 180 meters? Since its construction would separate the Grand Port to the east and the Port of Eunostos to the west, it was designed with channels at each end. These openings allowed passage from one port to the other. Hmm, that's cool. Along with creating separate harbors for the commercial and military shipping, the causeway served as a main aqueduct for the island's inhabitants. Its presence also helped protect the island and its ports from rough wind and sea currents. At the end of antiquity, the Heptastadion disappeared under layers of silt and soil, which formed an important sedimentary deposit. Hmm, okay. Seems to be more architecture speak. Not too fascinated about that one. Oh, this one's kind of a mission. Mission to get to. While the Serapion was the most celebrated of the temples in Alexandria, many other temples were built within the city. Most of these structures have been completely erased over time, and there is no way to discern how many existed. Oh, wow. However, Certainly research of ancient papyri hundreds. offered tantalizing hints as to the possible location of at least some of the temples. That's cool. Both papyri and coins reveal evidence of many temples built for the gods. Poseidon, the god of the sea, likely had an edifice in his honor west of this island, as well as on the mainland. This temple next to you is dedicated to Isit Beria, the divine protector of the lighthouse. This location hosted annual celebrations in the month of April, known as the Sacrum Feria, in connection to the lighthouse. In her incarnation as Isit Fortuna, the goddess carries a rudder and a cornucopia, both symbols of good luck for navigators. Okay. Thanks, uh... Considered one of the by, seven uh, wonders of the ancient world, the dreams. Lighthouse of Alexandria was a source of great pride for the inhabitants of the city. Construction began under Ptolemy I's reign and lasted 15 years. It was completed during his son's rule. Once completed, the lighthouse was dedicated to the gods for the salvation of those who sail the sea. It's actually quite huge, though. Built on the island of Ferris, the stone structure was three tiers set on top of one another, in a step formation. The second floor consisted of an octagonal tower, and the top floor was a cylindrical tower, topped by a statue. The interior provided space for staff rooms, and a ramp, which allowed the transport of fuel to the upper floors. Okay, so it's like an intense fortress. Essential to safe navigation through the rifts and shallow waters, the Ferris was a functioning lighthouse, with a beam reportedly visible 50 kilometers away. Wow, that's really impressive. It's unclear what kind of fuel was used, or how much. Any other details of how the light worked remain a mystery. Hmm. So don't have electricity, so... For several work? centuries, the Ferris was one of the highest wow. monuments ever built by man. It measured roughly 110 meters in height, compared to the Pyramid of Giza, which was around 140 meters tall. Oh, Gradually, the structure was eroded by earthquakes and then completely destroyed in 1480 CE 
when a fort was built over it. Archaeological excavations on the seabed have uncovered many blocks from the ancient building. Cool, so that thing's actually taller than the pyramids. But it's not around today, so we can't, can't visit it. No uh, tourism money. Egyptians were the, among the leading glass workers of the world. Fascinating. Oh wow, wood was so scarce. That's fascinating. Because now it's like, would you clear cut these things? Welcome to the Panaean. The Panaean was a temple built in honor of the god Pan, divinity of nature. Oh, Pan. This Achilles Greek friend. god, often represented as a half man, half goat, with a beard, horns, and goat's hooves, was considered the protector of shepherds and herds. Pan's attribute was his namesake musical instrument, the Pan Flute. His temples were usually located in caves and on high mountains, and were frequented by shepherds. It is likely that Mediterranean cults adopted the imagery of Pan to symbolize the Christian devil. Okay, relax. Do we hear that bang? That's why. It's not in the game. To give proper honor to the god, Alexandrians built an artificial hill upon which they housed his temple to compensate for the flat relief of the city. The artificial mound had the shape of a spinning top or a pine cone, which was accessed by a spiral staircase. The top had a panoramic view of the entire city. Huh, pan. Only such heights would be fitting for a mountain god. That's funny, panoramic, pan, got the pun going. All right, last one, the Hippodrome of Alexandria. Oh, cool, Egypt's primary luxury trade was with India. Silk, spices, ivory, ooh, ivory. You can use a mount to cover long distances quickly. Welcome to the Hippodrome of Alexandria. How do we get a mount though? The main hippodrome of the city was called the Legeon, in honor of Lagos, the ancestor of the Ptolemies. Alexandrians were great lovers of horse racing. They were fascinated by the rivalry of these races. The Agon, as it was said at that time, that every competition brought. Wow. It was a struggle for glory. Okay, horse racing. I like it, I like it. The most important chariot race was the Tethrapon. Using four horses with the quickest harness to the front right, the charioteer would race for 12 laps with sharp turns at either end of the Hippodrome. Let's, um... The victors were crowned with garlands of olive and received prize money. But the most sought after reward was to be acclaimed by the works of poets, such as Callimachus and Pindar. That's like Judah ben Hur. Or, uh, I think that's called Judah ben Hur. I don't remember, but the. Uh, that Ye hymns that rule thing. the lyre. What god, what hero, I, and what man shall we loudly praise? Verily, Zeus is the lord of Pisa. And Heracles established the Olympic festival. While Theron must be proclaimed by reason of his victorious chariot with its four horses, Theron, who is just in his regard for guests, and who is the bulwark of Akragas, the choicest flower of an auspicious line of sires, whose city towers on high, 
bringing wealth and glory to crown their native merits. That was some next level poetry at the end. Okay, so we finished the Alexandria chapter uh, segment. We got two left, daily life and then Romans. Uh, it's looking to be really good. I like uh, I like the lifestyle stuff, like finding out how people lived or why they believed in things. So the last two are sure to be promising. Stay tuned. Until next time. Grab some chairs. Take it. <laughs>